Good evening. We are here on the third day of uh, SOHO in Houston, September 2015. I have the great pleasure of introducing two of my colleagues in lymphoma, Dr. Jeremy Abramson from Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, who leads the lymphoma program there. And, and across the pond is uh, Dr. Peter Johnson from the University of Southampton. Both of you gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. So, uh, and the reason you're here is to spar on your topic, of course, uh, and the very uh, um, lively discussion that we had on the debate in lymphoma and diffuse large piece of lymphoma is the cell of origin uh, ready for prime time in terms of treatment, diagnosis and treatment. Uh, but if I may also add, uh, since you were there for the sessions, we may also talk a little bit more about the, the highlights or the presentations thus far. So, and it, it appears it's not just a, a difference across the pond or maybe the accent. Uh, you both had, took uh, extreme positions, but I guess I'll let you speak uh, to the uh, ideas. And uh, Jeremy, you spoke for the topic and you did say, and you were very excited and you presented a lot of data convincingly that uh, cell of origin is indeed uh, the way to go. Uh, Dr. Johnson took the uh, opposite uh, position, saying that, mm, I'm not sure. Jeremy, you want to start? Well, sure. I think it is, uh, I don't know if I'd say that cell of origin is the way to go, but a way to go. Uh, and certainly in the setting of a debate, of course, we, um, we have to take polarizing views when uh, the truth that we would probably both argue in the outside of the drama and theater of a debate lies somewhere in the gray zone. But that said, you know, I think what we've seen since cell of origin was initially described using transcriptional profiling is that using mRNA profiling, we know that activated B cell type DLBCL has an inferior prognosis compared to germinal center like DLBCL. Now, we don't presently use transcriptional profiling in the clinic, of course, and so we need some uh, uh, surrogate for, for uh, transcriptional profiling. And what's emerged there has been immunohistochemistry. And a number of different algorithms have been developed, the most commonly used being the Hans algorithm. And most studies have validated, including in the rituximab era, that activated B cell type, which is really not as specifically defined by immunohistochemistry, but non-germinal center like DLBCL still have an inferior prognosis compared to germinal center DLBCLs, although admittedly it is not a perfect surrogate, and so not every study has validated that. And I think the reason for that is uh, that there might not be perfect inter-observer um, correlation, uh, and so there, there has not been a perfect correlate there. And so I think you really do need expert hematopathologists evaluating this. So in considering whether cell of origin is ready for a prime time, you know, my arguments uh, against my distinguished opponent uh, were that it has value in terms of prognosis, uh, and our patients certainly are eager for, for prognostic modeling, and this has held true independent of the IPI, including with immunohistochemistry, chemistry, when well done. In terms of selection of therapy, I think there are a number of areas where cell of origin uh, has been useful. Uh, one area is primary mediastinal B-cell lymphoma. Uh, this is a unique subtype of B-cell lymphoma. It is derived from thymic B-cells. And we have evidence and uh, data that we've published that uh, our CHOP is associated with an unacceptably high rate of treatment failure, uh, that there's a high rate of primary refractory disease uh, when using our CHOP for primary mediastinal large cell lymphoma. And the vast majority of patients ultimately also require radiation therapy and the attendant late toxicities therein whereas there's more recent data uh, using dose-adjusted EPOC-R showing a progression-free and overall survival of 95% uh, in primary mediastinal large cell lymphoma and allowing the avoidance of radiation therapy in nearly all patients, showing that understanding the cell of origin helps determine that therapy. Now, I completely agree uh, with, uh, with my colleague uh, when Peter pointed out during the debate that uh, we don't need transcriptional profiling to identify primary mediastinal lymphoma. Uh, we can identify it uh, and if using. And just a chest X-ray. You can he identify with chest X-ray. I thought uh, I had never heard of a chest X-ray. We don't use those anymore. We Every use now and again, we go, we go mad and do a CT scan. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and while that uh, is no doubt true, you don't need transcriptional profiling to under, to make the diagnosis. But it is an example of where a unique biologic subset of disease might respond differentially, and knowing that information helps you select your therapy. 
looking at the traditional cell of origin subtypes, activated B cell type and germinal center subtype, we know that using standard chemotherapy platforms, there may be differential responses within biologic subsets. Um, using um, intensive therapy, such as dose-adjusted EPOC-R, in a phase two analysis, we see that the germinal center patients still do better than activated B cell type patients in the CLGB study. But very interestingly, the germinal center patients appear to do dramatically better. Um, uh, and here, the progression-free and overall survivals were again over 95%, suggesting that maybe dose-adjusted EPOC-R is actually selectively lifting, making favorable patients all the more favorable. The activated B cell type patients still doing differently. Um, similarly, the uh, French have studied RACVBP, which is a highly intensive chemotherapy regimen. It's a CHOP-like regimen, including bleomycin, followed by consolidation with methotrexate, ifosamide etoposide, and, and subcutaneous cytarabine. In their randomized trial compared to RCHOP on a 21-day schedule, they actually had an improved progression-free and overall survival in the overall population in DLBCL. But when they looked at the biologic subsets, at GC versus non-GC DLBCL. Interestingly, there was no difference between those two um, treatments in germinal center-like DLBCL patients. They did well regardless of the treatment they received. But the activated B cell type patients drove the difference in the randomized trial. And in fact, there was an overall and progression-free survival benefit that was statistically significant when getting RACVBP. So even with the traditional chemotherapy platform, we might want to target these subsets differently. And that was a randomized trial. The next sort of question is in standard chemotherapy and relapse refractory disease. If we look at the CORAL study, which compared our ICE and our DHAP in that randomized trial, there was no difference again in the overall study population. But once again, similar to the French GILA study uh, in initially um, treated disease. If you look in relapse refractory patients and divide by cell of origin, it turns out there, that rice did not preferentially benefit one subset or another. But in the RDHAP arm, lo and behold, the germinal center DLBCL patients were doing better than the ABC patients, once again identifying a standard chemotherapy platform with preferential activity in a DLBCL subset. And that was a randomized clinical trial. I think perhaps it gets most interesting when we think about the biologic underpinnings of disease and what molecularly targeted agents might preferentially benefit. And here we know that activated B-cell type biology is driven by NF-kappa-B signaling. That chronic active um, uh, signaling of the BCR pathway drives NF-kappa-B, uh, and that there are other mechanisms uh, as well, including the interferon regulatory cascade, mighty 88 uh, 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 mutations as well. And so if you think about different targets within that that have already been well studied, we've got bortezomib, uh, which targets NF-kappa-B. And though bortezomib has virtually no single agent activity in relapse DLBCL, there is evidence that in combination with chemotherapy, both in the relapse setting in a study with EPOC for relapse disease and in the newly diagnosed setting in combination with RCHOP, that in both of those analyses, phase two analyses, the non-germinal center patients appear to do just as well as the germinal center patients, suggesting in a tantalizing way that those patients' prognosis was being selectively um, t uh, uh, lifted. Now, I completely agree with Peter, uh, which is that that is suggestive, but by no means is that a substitute for a randomized trial. Uh, and so uh, those trials are ongoing. There are three randomized trials looking at RCHOP with or without bortezomib, and we will get that answer. Including Peter's trial. Including Peter's very important study. I, 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 think, I think we're probably in furious agreement here. Um, there's a recognition that understanding the cell of origin, understanding the molecular subtypes of lymphoma may well give us a much better handle on how we address using these new targeted agents which are able to pick out particular abnormalities in specific pathways. But I think what we have to be careful about is running before we can walk. So we need to know we have a test which is reproducible and widely applicable. And I think most people would recognize that immunohistochemistry is neither of those things. So we're down to some form of gene expression profiling, whether it's a small panel RNA test such as the nanostring test, or whether it's a broader gene expression panel. You have to add to that the genomic abnormalities and the mutations which you get, which are preferentially distributed to the different cell of origin types, but are not exclusive to those. So I think the cell of origin is helpful in providing a broad conceptual framework of 
broad subtypes of lymphoma, but if we really want to understand how we're going to apply these novel therapies and how we're going to specifically target the new agents that are coming through, we need to get to a higher level of definition in terms of the molecular phenotype, do the mutational analysis as well as the broad gene expression profiling, and make sure that what we rely on is prospective randomized studies rather than these slightly worrying historical comparisons. And even the, even the big retrospective analyses of things like the CORAL study are quite problematic in the way that they've been interpreted and the way that they've been done. So I think we need to wait the results of the randomized trials, essentially. And I couldn't agree more that, uh, that randomized control comparisons are, are no substitute. And in fact, one thing that's very clear is that the worst prognostic factor you can have in medicine is to be a historical control. Exactly. Never be a historical control. You always do worse than modern therapy. So if I may quickly recap, and since uh, this is a very important discussion, and one of the things that face, uh, faces, at least here, the, the practicing oncologist, uh, the guidelines, they have the NCCN guidelines, and Jeremy uh, alluded to the NCCN guidelines being the gold standard in, 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 day in and day out. They look at the NCCN guideline, it says cell of origin is important, but I think it's important for them to know, and you presented convincing data, and you said, no, I'm not sure, and for rightfully so, because uh, the, the way the poor man's GEP, as the immunistic chemistry is called, is not uh, reproducible for various reasons. And the phase two data is there; it's it's good, and uh, we'll come to that. Uh, so you are doing an interesting study. Could you perhaps tell us about the study that might answer this important question? So yes. So what we've tried to do is to use real-time gene expression profiling. So we've taken patients with newly diagnosed diffuse large B-cell lymphoma they've had their first cycle of our CHOP chemotherapy as standard. And then while that's been going on, we have done a full gene expression profile looking at 25,000 transcripts taken out of formalin fixed paraffin embedded material, which is surprisingly easy to get good quality RNA out of. We're successful in about 85% of cases. And we've then done a cell of origin allocation in order to stratify a randomization between continuing with our CHOP or continuing with our CHOP with the addition of bortezomib. But we took an agnostic view of the potential value of bortezomib at the beginning, and we said we would randomize everybody, germinal center type and ABC type, all the way through with certain stopping rules according to either safety and futility. And we've been through both of those gates and, in fact, have completed a cruel of just over 1,100 patients. So what that will enable us to do is to look at, firstly, whether you get a differential effect according to the cell of origin, but also to look at a much higher level of sophistication about whether there are other pr perhaps transcriptionally defined subgroups for whom bortezomib may or may not be an advantage. And allied to that, we've also done the mutation profiling in a subset of these patients where we've been able to get sufficiently good quality DNA to allow us to also map on the patterns of mutation in important targets like MyD88, the B cell receptor components, and all the signaling pathway as well. So I think it's those kind of studies we're going to need to do in the future where you start to integrate the clinical characteristics, the morphological immunophenotypic characteristics, and then the molecular type, both gene expression profile and genomic abnormalities. And I think that's the way we're going to head with our trials in the future. And the, and the cell of origin, I think, is the beginning of understanding. It by no means is the end. And the granularity with mutational analysis especially is helping us understand that, that we are oversimplifying DLBCL by suggesting that there's really just these two diseases. And looking at targeted therapy has further informed that. We know, for example, that ibrutinib, by targeting chronic active B cell receptor signaling in ABC DLBCL, has rationale for working. And we know that the response rate is superior in ABC patients than GCB patients. But we also know that it still only works in about a third of patients with ABC DLBCL, and the progression-free survival in that subset is only two months. So it's not as simple as just understanding cell of origin. And what the group at the NCI has nicely shown is that the mutational substructure is critical in, a, in, in assessing who is likely to respond. Patients with a MyD88 mutation and an activating CD79B mutation highly likely to respond to ibrutinib. People with a CARD11 mutation or an isolated MyD88 mutation unlikely to respond, activating CD79B somewhere in between. So it is a more complicated matter than just cell of origin. I think that's less clear with lenalidomide, 
which does also have preferential single agent activity in relapsed uh, DLBCL of activated B cell type as opposed to GC type. There, the response rate in non-GC patients is 53% and a median progression-free survival of six months, which for a non-transplant eligible patient is actually a relevant clinical finding. Excellent. So I guess both the points are well taken. I would say you're tempering the enthusiasm given this debate in the, in the setting of drama, but I should also say where empiricism meets rationalism with your clinical study, and we, it's a very important study that we're looking forward to. If I might change this uh, topic to a slightly different, add more practical consideration, of course, and most people don't realize, a lot of the community oncologists don't take this black and white notion, but what is gaining a bandwagon? Uh, uh, bandwidth, uh, so to say, is the double hit lymphomas. And I think that uh, nobody knows what to do with this. Can, can, can you both comment on the double hit lymphomas? There are a number of issues there. So firstly, it's what you define as a double hit lymphoma. And some people reg would regard immunohistochemical staining for usually BCL2 and MYC as defining that. And that will define about 30% of patients who probably have a worse prognosis. There's a hardcore group who have a genetic underlying basis, which is a translocation of BCL2 and make a double hit translocation, which is probably about somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, who also have a worse prognosis, and there's a good deal of overlap between those two, but obviously there's a number of patients who overexpress the protein who don't have the genetic underlying abnormality. What we do know is that they do much more badly with our CHOP than uh, other patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. What's not clear, and we don't have any prospective studies to, to help us in this, is how we should treat them better. So there's a big retrospective US study which was published last year or the year before, which suggested that intensive initial therapy, whether it's dose-adjusted EPOC, whether it's Codox MIVAC, whether it's Hyper-CVAD, probably has a better response rate and a possibly slightly better duration of remission. And there's also some soft data to suggest that first-line intensification with high-dose therapy and stem cell rescue may be helpful in a proportion of cases, but the numbers are too small to, to reach statistical significance. So I think we're really struggling with that group of patients, and very often there are a group of patients for whom very intensive therapy is, is not even possible, and for whom we clearly need new agents. The interesting thing is that there's some things on the horizon, particularly some of the, the molecules like the bromodomain inhibitors, which may be specifically able to target the target genes, the downstream genes of MYC, which look very promising in early trials. So I think there's, there's new agents coming through, but at the moment at least, we define them as a bad prognosis group. We know that we would like to do better with treatment. Where we can, we intensify it, but I think we're really still struggling. So could I ask you, and I see it's very, very good points, would you do more consolidation for these double hit patients? Of course, there's no data. Uh, in terms of doing transplantation or some kind of monitoring. Yeah, I mean, I agree entirely uh, with, with what Peter said. You know, the, the true worst actors are these, the true double hits, and I think when we use the term double hit, we really should be talking about translocations of MYC and BCL2 or BCL6 in concert with that MYC translocation. And those patients have a very rapid early failure rate and a very poor prognosis. But they also are a heterogeneous group. And one thing we know about these double hits is they are never just two hits in a double hit lymphoma patient. They always occur in the setting of a complex karyotype. And so these patients have a lot of driving their biology in addition to this proliferative and anti-apoptotic effect of MYC and BCL2 respectively. And in our uh, large U.S. Uh, cooperative retrospective analysis, we did identify that there is a small subset of double hit lymphoma patients that actually have a favorable prognosis and who actually did fairly well with our CHOP with or without radiation. And those were patients who had limited stage disease, had normal LDH, uh, patients without leukemic or circulating disease, uh, and obviously without CNS involvement. Now that represents only about 10% of patients with double hit lymphoma um, and probably is a unique entity with less genomic complexity. As far as the typical double hits, their advanced stage, the LDH is often sky high. Um, you know, uh, I'm compelled that, that intensified therapies might have a higher uh, rate of inducing remission, but as Peter points out, this is a disease of older adults. These are often patients you can't give hyper CVAD to, you can't give Codox M IVAC to. And so uh, I've most commonly been using dose-adjusted EPOC-R in those patients. I don't think by any means that's a panacea for these patients. The treatment failure rate is still high, which leads to the question of, is there a role for consolidation? 
And I have to say, I think the numbers have been small in our multicenter analysis. Uh, there was no statistical uh, improvement uh, favoring transplant consolidation versus no transplant consolidation. The same thing was observed in a single center study by MD Anderson. And both of our analyses looked very specifically at patients who achieved a complete remission and then were transplanted or not. The reason that's important is if you just take all double hit lymphoma patients and say those people who got a transplant versus no transplant, how did they do? Well, what you're going to be doing is enriching the transplanted group for patients who achieved a CR in the first place, as opposed to a lot of these patients who have primary factor disease and aren't a, tran a candidate for transplant. So if you limit the analysis to CR patients, there really is not compelling evidence for benefit. However, um, uh, these retrospective data are by no means definitive. I typically do not transplant patients in first remission. I certainly think that in the, in the absence of definitive data, it is not unreasonable to do so, uh, but I'm not convinced that it offers a benefit just yet. Fair enough. I think it's, it's a good discussion on the, double, uh, on the, on the uh, cell of origin and the double hit, uh, even though uh, Dr. Johnson won the debate, not because of his accent, but because of you know, tempered enthusiasm and there's more data to come. We'll shift gears and just staying on DLBCL, there's a lot of exciting discussion we had, of course, uh, on, on not just the cell of origin, the BCR signaling, and you alluded, alluded to the fact that some of these GCB patients do respond to BCR inhib inhibitory therapies, and uh, perhaps we need to look more into that. But getting into the, some of the more exciting agents, what do you see out there that excites you in terms of cellular therapies or the newer molecules? I, I think we're in an amazingly exciting time in lymphoma treatment. We have the inhibitors of brutin tyrosine kinase, we have the inhibitors of PI3 kinase, we have the inhibitors of the other B cell receptor signaling parts, we have nuclear export inhibitors, a variety of targeted agents, some of which have come through, particularly things like BTK inhibitors and PI3 kinase inhibitors, and are really finding their way into routine clinical application more and more. And for me, one of the most interesting ideas is that we're moving away from conventional cytotoxic treatment as the first line of, of attack against something like follicular lymphoma. And the idea that in the future we'll be looking at perhaps combinations of lenalidomide and rituximab as our first line approach to most people with follicular lymphoma requiring treatment, I think is really interesting. And looking at the historical data where we found it difficult to see an increase in overall survival, we're really starting to see a change. And a lot of that, of course, is the monoclonal antibodies and rituximab but also increasingly in the last few years, the new agents coming through as well. And we really are seeing the survival curves moving progressively upwards and upwards so that we're looking at a median survival if the current cohorts of follicular lymphoma, probably of the order of 20 years. And that's down to the real hard-nosed application of science, understanding the molecular biology, and turning this into things we can do in the clinic. I think it's an incredibly exciting time. Excellent, and that is something that Nathan Fowler presented uh, to the R Square and the updated um, uh, randomized study that's going to come up, and hopefully for Ash and, and for the recent future. How about to you, Jeremy? Yeah, I certainly agree that the writing is on the wall for chemotherapy in follicular lymphoma, and I think ultimately, similar to what we're already seeing in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, that chemotherapy is probably ultimately going to be reserved to niche settings and not for all patients. Certainly the lenalidomide and rituximab data is looking very, uh, very appealing, and we'll see what the randomized relevance trial shows, and whether it supplants chemotherapy in the upfront settings. Certainly the phase two trials look very promising in that regard. Um, incorporating BTK and PI3 kinase inhibitors and bringing those earlier into frontline setting, those studies are ongoing, and combining these drugs. Um, the other agents that I think are looking very exciting, certainly uh, the um, venetoclax, the small molecule inhibitor of BCL2. We saw some nice data uh, reviewed uh, today as well, where that agent is showing dramatic activity, of course, in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, where it will get its first uh, FDA label. But there are also, especially at higher doses, actually very encouraging responses across multiple other lymphoma subtypes, including mantle cell lymphoma most prominently, but also diffuse large B cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, and others. Um, and what is exciting about a BCL2 inhibitor is that it might um, act as a single agent, but also might partner beautifully with other drugs where upregulation of anti-apoptotic proteins might be a dominant mechanism of drug resistance. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that drug alone and in combination. 
We also heard a lot of very exciting data today about immune checkpoint inhibitors, and I think targeting the immune microenvironment is one of the last sort of untapped markets uh, in, uh, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma therapy, as well as follicular lymphoma and others. Lenalidomide is now working, we think, very strongly in the microenvironment by targeting that immune synapse and restoring immune killing of those cells. But it might be that this PD-1, PD-L1 pathway is also critically important, uh, whereby uncloaking uh, these tumor cells from the uh, immune microenvironment uh, by interrupting the the, uh, the PD-L1, PD-1 interaction will allow immune targeting, and we're seeing that, no question, in the initial trials, early evidence of NICE activity, both in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. And I think the big question is, when you bring in uh, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, lenalidomide, uh, the PI3 kinase inhibitors, um, uh, the um, uh, BTK inhibitors and the BCL2 antagonists is how are we going to learn to combine these agents and how are we going to target them based on, on, on histologic subsets as well as, more importantly, the, the underlying mutational analyses. And I think that is uh, the era of targeted therapy that is upon us. And ultimately, this is going to lead us into personalized medicine. And we're not actually, this is no longer seeming like science fiction. This is seeming uh, like the, uh, the very real-time future that faces uh, lymphoma investigators and, more importantly, lymphoma former patients. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we are getting to a point that both of you raised uh, uh, that at some point we'll have the right treatment for the right patient, but we're still not there yet. Well, what about uh, the exciting data from the University of Pennsylvania? Dr. Schuster presented the CAR-Ts and the activity is more in follicle lymphoma, maybe less so in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, but still very, very promising. I think, I think using chimeric engineered T-cells to target a B-cell receptor such as CD19 is clearly highly active treatment and using it against low-grade lymphoid malignancy such as CLL, such as follicular lymphoma, I think is certainly promising. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, a little bit more difficult to tell and I think the difficulty is that you have an illness whose tempo is such that it may be quite difficult for a, a T-cell infiltrate to get on top of the disease mm -hmm. before the disease gets on top of the, the T-cells. So I think w we wait to see. This at the moment is still a complex treatment which it's difficult to deliver uh, and for which we don't really understand the long-term sequelae. What we do know is that these patients become profoundly B-cell aplastic and that they require lifelong immunoglobulin replacement therapy to make up for the fact that they have effectively have no native B-cells when the treatment is successful. And I think the jury is still out about whether that has long-term consequences for patients. At the, number, at the moment, the numbers are small and the follow-up is relatively short. So I think we are waiting to see. I think it's an excellent proof of principle, but I think we probably have alternative approaches for most people with low-grade lymphomas at the moment that will be more attractive. Yeah, uh, you know, there are now multiple companies that are commercializing CAR T cells and bringing them into their phase one studies. And all of these compounds are different. They use different co-stimulatory domains and signaling domains. Uh, the data presented from Penn uses a 4-1-BB and CD3 Zeta uh, chain. And the follicular lymphoma data was excellent, but as Peter points out, relapse refractory follicular lymphoma, we can no longer really consider an unmet medical need. Uh, based on all these agents we've talked about. So I think that though the, the data it looks extraordinary, it's a small number of patients without necessarily um, uh, a huge need. Now, large cell lymphoma is a different story. Large cell lymphoma in the relapse setting is still an unmet medical need. Uh, we still cure only a minority of patients with relapsed DLBCL using high-dose chemotherapy, and that only applies to patients who are even candidates for high-dose chemotherapy. So the ma majority of people with relapsed large cell lymphoma will still die of large cell lymphoma, and there is very little um, that is making a huge splash in that space, though there are a number of promising things. So I find the data very intriguing. They did have a 50% response rate, which is pretty good for anything in relapsed DLBCL, but what was most impressive about those, Peter, is they were durable. Uh, in six of seven, they were durable. A couple of those were out longer than a year. I've personally had the experience of patients on those studies uh, who had highly refractory disease and had dramatic responses, though clearly not all of them will. So I think this is very exciting therapy. I think it will be, uh, uh, hopefully be something that we are ultimately using in, in, in areas of, of lymphoma where we can no longer uh, have curative intent therapy because it does appear that though in a subset of patients that CAR T cells might provide curative intent therapy to patients where there currently are no curative intent options. Certainly. I, I, I think diffuse large B cell lymphoma is one of the most 
difficult areas at the moment. We're in the midst of a kind of demographic explosion. The huge increase in the numbers of patients over the age of 75 that we see with diffuse large B cell lymphoma, born of the fact that we have an aging population and the incidence has gone up over the last 20 years. Some of the most difficult decisions we have in our clinics, I think, are patients with an Ill illness which is theoretically curable but practically incurable because of comorbidity or because of their general health in other respects. And I think what we badly need are more effective first-line treatments, potentially using some of the targeted agents to make up for the fact that we can't give very intensive chemotherapy, and then more effective treatments at the time of recurrence if, if we get to that point. But I think if we're going to make a big difference for older people with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, it's probably going to be as a component of the first-line therapy. Excellent. And just one final discussion on the mantle cell. Uh, you saw Andy Zelenitz talk about the mantle cell, and he's not allowed to talk about chemotherapy, even though there are a lot of questions that remain. Uh, uh, but w w what, are, what what's your take on mantle cell? Uh, of course, there's so much heterogeneity in mantle cell as is there in diffuse large B cell. Well, I think mantle cell is a disease that has actually proven a, a ripe testing ground for novel agents and a ripe area for approval of novel agents because it is uh, still a biologically heterogeneous disease, uh, no question about it. And Andy did point out that there is this indolent variant of mantle cell lymphoma, uh, which looks often a little bit more like CLL. These are patients that often have a uh, minimal am amount of adenopathy, large spleen circulating disease, and a very favorable prognosis, unlike most patients historically with mantle cell lymphoma, and that those patients are characterized biologically uh, by having um, uh, mutated uh, IGH variable regions similar to favorable prognosis CLL, and also having um, absence of the expression of a protein SOX11, which tracks with that, and there are now commercially available SOX11 antibodies. So if we remove the sort of favorable subset which need minimal therapy and the more aggressive cases of mantle cell lymphoma, we're seeing very exciting results with lenalidomide in combination with rituximab in the relapse refractory setting, uh, a very nice uh, remission rate and, and, and um, remissions that can last even over a year in those patients, certainly not curative therapy. There's some upfront data that came out of uh, New York uh, a small phase two study of lenalidomide rituximab uh, with about an 80% progression-free survival at two years uh, with ongoing follow-up. There are ongoing treatment failures, but certainly very encouraging early data with non-chemotherapy-based strategies. Abrutinib, of course, is FDA approved uh, with a, um, a substantial response rate uh, in relapsed mantle cell lymphoma and a progression-free survival uh, median of just under one year. Um, and so I think, you know, already we're seeing evidence of activity, though not sustained responses. So where Andy, I think, presented some tantalizing evidence was there is certainly uh, activity of the BCL2 antagonist, venetoclax, uh, in mantle cell lymphoma. There is initial activity with PI3 kinase inhibitors with a nice initial response rate to the PI3K delta inhibitor, but a very brief progression-free survival. Uh, and so, and there's some emerging data on cyclin-dependent kinase inhibitors. So I think, as with other subsets of lymphoma, the non-chemotherapy-based future for mantle cell lymphoma is going to be taking these active biologic agents, understanding the mechanisms of resistance to monotherapy, and bringing these together in combination to offset drug resistance and hopefully have sustained responses to non-chemotherapy-based treatments. These are very exciting, but I should also point out, and going back to the question of chemotherapy, there's the divide across the Atlantic and the, 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 the Europeans uh, were way ahead in trying to look, study this longitudinally, doing the induction part and doing the transplant and the maintenance. And I guess that sort of answers and helps understand the biology and the treatment options here while we're banging away with all these treatment options with molecular therapies. I guess you're answering the other part of the question. I, I, I think mantle cell lymphoma has been a bit frustrating in terms of really getting to grips with the biology. And whilst we have these two apparent subtypes at the moment, you can't help feeling that we still haven't really got to grips with what the full extent of the biological heterogeneity is that we're dealing with. Certainly there's a, there's a place for the kind of sequential intensive chemotherapy approaches such as the Nordic group have taken with alternating uh, escalated CHOP, alternating with high dose cytarabine, which seems to be particularly effective at getting the patients who are young enough and fit enough to tolerate it into remission with a view to then high dose therapy and potentially maintenance rituximab, the results for which look extremely good. But I agree, 
I think the targeted agents are coming in a very big way. I think we're seeing excellent results with ibrutinib, with lenalidomide, with the BH3 mimetics, and uh, uh, there's clearly a lot to be done. The difficulty, of course, is the numbers of patients with mantle cell lymphoma are so much smaller than follicular lymphoma and diffuse large B. So running big trials is absolutely critical to have big international collaborative efforts. And I think that's where the European Mantle Cell Consortium has done so well, is to bring people together to get behind a single protocol. Excellent points, and I, I know we could talk forever, but I guess we've been trying to understand the heterogeneity, and it's not just garden variety type lymphomas, quote unquote, but we're looking at each one of these disease separate entities, and eventually we'll get to the point where we can match the right treatment for the right disease, and also for the right patient, and the patient profile is also as important. Thank you, gentlemen, for this very, very good elucidation of, and, and your uh, insights. Thank, Thank you. you.